Hello and welcome to the Friday, November 16th, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Pratt today wrote up his latest findings regarding the Emotet malware. Now, Emotet has a number of different ways how it usually arrives, but often it does arrive with the good old Word document with macros. It can also first trick you to download the Word document by clicking on a link or by embedding the link in a PDF. But ultimately, you will end up with a Word document, you have to enable macros, and then Emotet starts and does its thing. Now, over the years, Pratt has documented a number of different payloads that have been spread by Emotet. The latest one he's looking at is a banking Trojan. Now, Emotet started out with its own banking Trojan then I think it was last month uh, Pratt actually wrote about how Emotet was used to spread Sue's Panda which is another popular banking Trojan. The latest uh, one that uh, Pratt saw pop up on Wednesday was Iced ID. Yet another banking Trojan and again Emotet is just used as the delivery vehicle. Apparently the way this works is that the crew behind Emotet does a rent out its services and then does install these banking trojans for other groups. Sad part of course is yes it still works, we still have people that will happily enable macros. And exposed container services are of course a nice target for an attacker that tries to deploy their own workload. Latest example here is a blog by Juniper that looks at how Docker servers are being used in order to install crypto coin miners. The way this usually starts out is with a scan for port 2375 and 2376. These are two ports that the Docker REST management API is listening on. Now by default it's not actually listening on these ports. It's not turned on to listen for remote connections at all. It only listens on a local socket. But well uh, if you do want to have remote access to your Docker service then you may enable these ports and not properly protect them which then leads to a simple remote code execution. Via this API an attacker can launch Docker containers and also execute shell scripts on the host. That is then being used in order to download additional tools and install the crypto coin mining. What's a little bit different here from other crypto coin miners that I've seen is that these infected Docker instances then will also actively scan for new vulnerable hosts. The attacker here installs mass scan which is a very popular a script to scan large parts of the internet very quickly for open ports. Other than that, it's sort of your basic crypto coin miner install script. It uses tools like curl and apt get and such in order to install additional software and finally also install the crypto coin miner. And one group of devices that has been making the news in a bad way multiple times over the last year or so is cheap GPS watches that some parents are purchasing to track their kids. These watches usually have a GPS sensor built in and then they use a cellular connection to periodically update a remote service with the location. And this can happen as often as every couple minutes. The problem is that this API uses essentially no real authentication. For the parent to track their kids, they're using a mobile application in order to again connect to the same API. And first of all, these API calls are in the clear, not using TLS. Secondly, the only authentication is a family ID, which essentially is just a simple serial number that's very easily brute forced. The result is that anybody can track essentially any of these watches and it's not just the current location that you are able to retrieve, you can also retrieve the location history for individual watches. 
Now, a while ago, Mozilla started rolling out Firefox Monitor. Firefox Monitor essentially was a front end for Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned database that monitors any accounts, whether or not they have been leaked as part of a large data breach. Well, uh, Firefox is now moving a step further with this service and it will start displaying a little pop-up message whenever a user is visiting a site that leaked data in the past. Which sites are exactly included isn't quite clear here if, for example, very old breaches are being included here or just more recent ones. But again, this is mostly based on Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned data and it should be rolled out to Firefox users over the next weeks. This is of course a nice and somewhat useful service for users, but I think another effect will be is that it really sort of increases the reputational damage that sites encounter if they're being breached and maybe it will actually make companies care more about not getting breached. So it's Friday again and uh, today I have yet another STI student with me to talk about his work. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Great. I'm Dave Kennel. I'm on the management track uh, with the STI program. Uh, I actually just graduated uh, last month and my final research paper was on the Linux kernels auditing mechanism and kind of how that reacts underneath actual uh, simulated attack patterns. So that's uh, great. So first of all, congratulations to graduating. <laughs> Usually we have people that sort of halfway through or uh, three quarters uh, through the program. Now this uh, Linux kernel auditing system, I really like your paper because it's, uh, I think, a feature in Linux that's often overlooked and uh, really sort of a very great way to figure out what's going on in your system. Can you explain a little bit what that auditing system does? Sure. The auditing system is actually incredibly powerful. Uh, it focuses on two primary audit paths, one being syscall-based, meaning that you can audit pretty much any syscall that's passing between user land and the kernel, or you can audit activity on files. There's a third kind of vector. There are what they call trusted applications. There's only a few of those, but they also will generate their own audit entries uh, pretty much without any configuration at all on a part of the user. So is this a feature that's turned on by default in sort of your common Linux distributions or something you have to turn on and uh, configure? It kind of varies. Uh, more security-focused distributions, enterprise-focused distributions will typically drop it and turn it on by default. Uh, the problem there tends to be that while they turn it on and it's enabled by default, they give you a default rule set that's, for all intensive purposes, empty, modulo, maybe uh, a setting for a buffer to increase the default buffer size. Uh, so it's not really looking at a whole lot in its default state. You will get mostly audit records that are coming in from uh, those trusted applications that I mentioned. So it will see stuff like SSH in particular and log on type activity. Now, how susceptible is the system to uh, rootkits? Uh, can they uh, replace it, turn it on, turn it off? Or like, is any user that has root level access essentially able to control that auditing system? Yeah, that's really cool. One of the really cool things about the auditing system is you can actually mark the loaded rule set as immutable so that the rules cannot be changed after the system has booted. So it would take a reboot then to cause the rule set to change once you've marked it as immutable. So that's actually one of the really, really cool things is that the audit system is very difficult to evade for an attacker. It also has capabilities in the newer versions of audit to be able to send that audit stream to a remote system uh, in the same way that we've been doing with Syslog for years. 
So that's actually great because that's one of the problems with syslog that an attacker usually you know, can just turn it off and uh, get away without it. Now, you mentioned your paper, you looked at a couple of specific attacks. Can you sort of walk us through one of them and s tell us how the auditing system really applied to that attack? Sure. Uh, the auditing system, uh, or rather, uh, I did a, a number of different attacks kind of looking at stuff that was pretty common in terms of what we see in, in the wild type attacks against Linux systems. So we'll talk about one that was really, really visible uh, on the Internet right now and has been for decades. There are or for a decade pretty much at this point. Uh, there has been a giant distributed SSH password guessing attack. Um, uh, and weak credentials are one of the primary vectors that attackers use to get into systems, uh, SSH and that whole log on process with SSH is one of those trusted, uh, accounts or trusted applications rather that I mentioned earlier. So when I did an SSH password guessing attack against the system running audit D, that attack was hugely visible in the audit stream. Uh, because every single one of those attempts was logged not only by the, the syslog, but also by the audit system. And had one of those uh, attempts succeeded and an attacker gotten in and edited the, the syslog, you would still have that audit log. They wouldn't be able to evade that. Um, on the flip side, somewhere where audit D was not effective, uh, I looked at... Uh, the effect of a SQL injection attack against an installed web application on the system. And that SQL injection attack went completely unobserved by the audit system, both with its default configuration, which contains very little, and the other configurations that I was using, the controlled access protection profile configuration and the DSA STIG configuration. None of those were able to see that because it was too high up in the application layer. And we weren't monitoring the kinds of activity at the syscall level that would be visible to Audit D. Now, I guess with the SQL injection attack, uh, some of this, you know, you may be able to see like in your web application firewall logs and such. Would Audit D then kick in once the attacker is on the system and starting to, to modify the system, maybe doing something like a privilege escalation attack or something on the system. Is this something that you would expect Audit D to see, uh, even if it doesn't see the initial SQL injection attack? Yeah, if the, if the attacker is using SQL injection to pivot into uh, the system itself, they actually make that transition from the database layer into the actual system. They're beginning to modify operating system files, or they're getting the operating system to do things uh, that the Audit D is listening for, uh, then uh, that's where Audit D really comes into its own because you can monitor uh, very fine-grained access to the system, both at the syscall level and at the uh, file level. One of the really uh, powerful ones is to actually establish watches, uh, which is the, what SE Linux calls it when you want to monitor a file, over those critical files that shouldn't be accessed except by very controlled processes. Uh, for example, uh, I went after uh, the password database in a couple of attacks. And if you have a watch set for all access to Etsy Shadow, it gives you a very good idea of when a, an unauthorized process has accessed that file. So these would be then some of the customizations that you may want to make, uh, for example, you know, add these watches to critical files, like let's say if you keep encryption keys somewhere for your web application or such, those are the files you would then monitor with this uh, in order to detect any illegitimate access. Absolutely. Anything else you're working on these days? Anything so that's next for you after you graduated now uh, from the program? A uh, lot of work. Um, I work for uh, Los Alamos National Security, and they keep me pretty busy on a day-to-day -day basis. 
That sounds like a really interesting job. So thanks again for being here and for talking about your research. And that's it for today. So thanks again, everybody, for listening. I'll add a link to the paper to the show notes and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.